Well, good morning. It is wonderful seeing each and every one here today on this very special day of Easter as we remember that the tomb is empty and we celebrate our risen Lord uh, as uh, I know many churches will do in a response. Uh, goes, He is risen. He is risen indeed. And we are so glad uh, for that today. Let me welcome each and every one to Marcel Baptist Church. This is uh, an honor and a pleasure to be before you today. Uh, my name is Daniel Gregory. I have the uh, awesome privilege of being pastor here and want to welcome each and every one, especially our guests. It might be this is your first or your second time here, uh, but I want to uh, extend a welcome from the church and I hope everyone makes you feel uh, blessed by being here today. If you have never done it before in your bulletin, there's this little welcome card, and um, if we never had a record of your time here, you could just fill that out, and um, before you leave, either place it in one of the offering plates or in the box back in the back. We'd love to have a record of your time here with us. Um, just a few announcements, probably the, uh, the biggest one. Please, please, please read through your bulletins as uh, there is so much going on over the next couple of weeks. We'd love to have you be a part of. Uh, one thing in particular, this Wednesday, we're uh, beginning a new Wednesday night Bible study series. Um, this is by Francis, uh, Francis Chan. Um, it's in the book of Job. Uh, it's very similar to the one, um, one of the ones we've done a, a while back, but uh, it's a brief video and then a lot of looking into God's Word. And I do hope uh, you'll be a part of that as it's a great little study. Um, also, you'll notice in your bulletin that um, there's a request for an individuals to provide a meal um, on April 26th. That is not correct. April 26th is going to be our last day of revival, um, so we won't be having a meal on that particular particular Sunday. So you can just go ahead and mark that one uh, off. Um, please don't forget also, this coming, uh, this coming Saturday, uh, Randy and Janet Adams has invited everybody to re uh, meet Richard and Rachel Liu, uh, missionary friends. Um, that is on April 15th. In information is there in the bulletin. Um, so you can, uh, you can find out all about that. Um, so uh, I know that will be a wonderful, wonderful day on uh, Saturday. Um, and uh, I want to thank each and every one for coming out uh, for the sunrise service this morning and breakfast. Had plenty of food. We had a great time of fellowship together. Um, one last thing, the flowers are placed in the sanctuary today to the glory of God and in recognition of Bill and Lillian McKee's wedding anniversary. This year would have marked their 57th wedding anniversary. So we're very, very thankful for uh, these flowers. Um, also today, our, uh, in Sunday school, we had one Sunday school class at Perfect Attendance, the Friendship class. So let's give them a big round of applause. Uh, as always, uh, we, we invite everyone to come out and be a part of Sunday school. Um, we have classes for all ages. Um, during the 10 o'clock hour. So if you uh, aren't a part of the uh, Sunday school class yet, we'd love to have you to be a part of that. That being said, are there any other announcements, anything else that is, uh, is coming up that needs, needs to be made known? Well, let's, let's begin our service this morning. I'm going to ask Danny to come forth to, for our invocation as we begin our service together. Let's pray. Gracious Almighty God, we're so thankful for the chance to be in your house today. Um, thankful for this Easter Sunday. And, uh, as the rains from the last few days have gone away and the sun came out again today, it's just a reminder of, um, of your resurrection and uh, the light that came to our world after that, that event, Lord. Um, we're so thankful for the sacrifice that, that, that you made when you sent your son to Jesus and he died for us. And just... Um, let us remember that today, Lord. Let us remember that today and, and every day. Um, and that's why we're here. That's the significance of, of what we follow, what we worship. Um, please go with us now and start our worship hour. Let the things that are done and said be pleasing to you. Let them touch our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, let's stand to our feet as we read the Word of God today. Luke 24, uh, verses 1 through 9. The 
the record of that very first resurrection morning. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Let's sing unto our glorious Savior, Christ the Lord is risen today, hymn number 367. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Let's sing unto the Lord today.
um, this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer, who else can we remember today? Let's go before the Lord, remembering these that have been mentioned, as well as those that are on our hearts. Father, Lord, as we come before you today, we are, we are so grateful and we're joy-filled that the tomb is empty. That means so much for us. Lord, we praise you today for the great and the mighty work you did at Calvary through the empty tomb to give us new life. Lord, humbly as we go before you, we have these many, many requests on our hearts and our, on our minds as we have those that are our dear friends and brothers and sisters in Christ that are sick and upon the beds of affliction. Lord, we acknowledge you as the great physician and we pray that you would give, give healing and help during this hour of need. Father, I pray for these that that are just in need of your healing touch. Lord, may you sweep into their life. Let your presence be known to reveal your power to them. Lord, I thank you for the many that I know are, are feeling better because of sickness. Um, just being had in the last week. Lord, I pray that you would give continued healing. It's so... Uh, so many are, are battling various bugs and uh, coughs and, and infections. Lord, I, I pray that you would help in this time. Lord, we want to lift up those that are mourning the loss of loved ones. Lord, grief is, is a pain that we all go through, and it's so difficult. We pray that you would walk with these that are, that are going through this valley of life now to give the help that they need. Lord, I pray that you would bless our church as we do our best to minister in your name, as we, we look and, and strive to, to give you glory, to, to share the gospel, to touch hearts and lives. Lord, empower us that we might do so, that, Lord, you would be glorified in the midst of, of each and every thing that we do. Lord, help us now through this service. May your Holy Spirit move within our hearts that a great and a mighty work might be done today. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. This time let me call the children forth for a children's sermon. So I get to share a little bit of, um, of, of my personal childhood um, this morning. Because um, I, don't, I don't know if this is still out. Y'all have to inform me a little bit on this. It is great seeing all of y'all here today. Um, how many of y'all have ever looked at a book like, like that? A Ripley's Believe It or Not. Anybody may ever, you know, look through one of them. They, they uh, I, I know... They had some in the library and all. They were a big thing. Um, you, you ever? I've read Weird but true. Weird but true. Very similar. Uh, same, same line there. You ever seen the Ripley's Believe It or Not? I saw it in the library. There you go. So it, it's a neat little book. If you want to, um, it, it's not like a real <coughs> story book, but it's little things that um, Ripley, I, I forget his first name, he, uh, it was a guy that, that actually collected these weird, odd stories. In fact, if you go to um, South Carolina, I think there was a, uh, a museum there um, that was filled with all of these these types of things. But Ripley's, believe it or not, um, actually had a had a time in a paper that it would it would publish these odd, weird, interesting stories, <coughs> and he would give a, a, a story. For example, there was a story in the Civil War, where after a, a big battle had occurred, somebody was walking through, and somebody was kind of uh, looking at all the, all the things there, you know, as the, as the Civil War battle would go in, you, you could see bullets that had landed on the ground. Well, lo and behold, he had found two bullets that had hit each other.
each other in midair and fuse together. You know, the bullet on one side, the bullet on another. Now that sounds like an unbelievable story, right? But he could produce the bullets. There was a, a story that he told. And I don't know. I don't know the, the truth of it, but he said that there was a there were a group of people that could shoot arrows through a glass jar and not shatter the jar, just like punching a hole through a, a piece of paper to do that. And he would show the jar. There was all of these amazing, weird, and, and crazy stories. And of course, you know, the, the title, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Well, here, here's the thing. Easter morning is much like a Ripley's Believe It or Not. Because here it is that what we recognize in the last couple of days within the, within the calendar of the Christian faith is that this last week was Holy Week. It was the week in which Jesus went into Jerusalem. He celebrated Passover, um, like, like we had celebrated communion on Thursday, uh, on, on Monday Thursday. And then he was betrayed. He was put through a mockery of a trial. He was sentenced to death. And he died on the cross. And everybody had seen him there. He was on the cross, pierced hands, pierced feet. Uh, a Roman soldier had come and pierced his side, and they knew he was dead. And they took his body and they wrapped it in a linen cloth. They placed him in a tomb. He was there one night, two, and then on the third morning, the Easter morning that we recognize, he rose again and he was out. The tomb, the Roll, the stone was rolled away. And people would go in and they looked and they said, wait a minute here, where's Jesus? And the angel said, well, he's not here, he's risen. Now when they began to tell the story, it was like, believe it or not, the ladies that were the first ones to ever go to the tomb, they went back to the disciples and they said, hey, Jesus is risen just as he said. Now what do you think the disciples did? They, you think they just like, boom, they automatically believe? No. They like, look, took out, like, no, that can't be. And you know what they saw when they looked in the tomb? They didn't see nothing. Well, they saw a burial cloth. That was it. It was a Ripley's Believe It or Not event. But the thing is, the disciples, though they were a little bit skeptical, they went and they saw and they believed. And you know, what we have is that story. Just like Ripley wanted to publish all of his, his stories that he had collected, we have one that beats them all. We say we serve a Savior who died for us. That was buried. But on Easter morning, what do we celebrate? We celebrate that he rose again. We have the greatest news of all. Now, we can't go and go all the way back to Jerusalem and look in the, in the tomb and, and say, well, it's still empty. We, we can't really do that. You know what we can do is we can look in our Bibles and we can tell people how much Jesus has made a difference in our own life and how much Jesus made a change in us. And just as we sing many a times, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today, he walks with me and talks with me a long life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. I know, uh, you ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my, heart. within my heart. So this morning, as we think about Easter, I want y'all to remember that we have a Ripley's Believe It or Not event, but we have a great thing to say. We have great news. See, we want to tell people about maybe two bullets or some arrows. But you know what's even better? To be able to tell people that Jesus died and he rose again. So this morning, um, I, I actually did not make these out, but we had uh, some, some wonderful individuals in the church um, actually provide little Easter baskets for y'all. So uh, we, I'm able to, uh, to bless y'all in amazing ways today because 
I'll tell you what, um, this goes above and beyond what, what I use with Gia. But, uh, Easter is an amazing day that we're able to celebrate. So let's celebrate it in an amazing way. Give them a big round of applause. For and now the choir. <laughs>
Scripture reading it comes from another gospel account of the resurrection. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. They came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. May God bless the reading of his word as we meditate upon it. everyone that has done so so much in the past couple of days Thursday and, and coming and being part of our Monday Thursday service also for Easter sunrise service this morning so many getting out at 
the crack of dawn, actually a, a, a little bit before the crack ever happened, um, in, in coming and, and being a part of the service. So much uh, went into this week with the choir and their beautiful music, all of the work there. So I do want to thank each and every one for all of their hard work. This morning, um, I want to look and, and answer a question. I want to answer a, a question about Easter. What is the big deal about Easter? Um, I want to get down to it. I want to get right to the point. I want to be like the guy that um, picked up a hot horseshoe one time and he didn't want to fess up that he made a mistake and picked up something hot. And when somebody confronted him and said, wow, that, boy, that thing was hot. He said, no, it just don't take me long to look at a horseshoe. <laughs> I'm going to get right to the point, not waste any time, about what Easter is all about. What is the big deal? What does it mean and why does it matter? We live in a world where we are oversaturated with news. We have news going on 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. We can find out stuff left and right that does not make any difference to us. Um, did you know that over the next week in Honolulu, Hawaii, the uh, average temperature is a high of 80 degrees. It is a low of 72 degrees. It is gorgeous like the whole like next 10 days. It's good to know, but it doesn't matter to us, does it? Not unless you're going. Otherwise, you know, give me a holler. And if you have an extra ticket, um, I can pack quickly. Um <laughs> Tomorrow here it's 63 to 38 or give or take, something like that. <clears throat> We're overwhelmed with news and so often we miss out on what really, really matters. Today over a billion people will celebrate Easter worldwide. They will celebrate the risen Lord. Even though it is something that has happened 2,000 years ago approximately, there is, there is still tremendous celebrations. You know, it's amazing. A lot of people believe the resurrection but won't find themselves in church today. A Gallup poll done a while back said that 84% of people believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They believe it, but they don't go to church. When we think about the idea of, of Jesus dying on the cross, of him being buried and then raising from the dead, it was a historical fact. It was something that so many people saw. It was something that the disciples went and they saw the empty tomb. Anyone who was available could go and see the empty tomb. Jesus himself presented himself afterwards to hundreds of people. It was a fact. But what is the big deal. What is the big deal? Well, today I want to look at three truths that Easter reveals to us. Three truths that you can take from this place, and if you go and, and somebody asks you, you know, what's the big deal about Easter? I don't quite understand. Jesus rose from the dead, so what? You can give them these three and hopefully lead them towards Jesus Christ. Number one, what does it mean? What's the big deal? Easter reveals this truth, that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Jesus is who he claimed to be. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Jesus made some amazing and outrageous claims. He claimed to be equal with the Father. He claimed his own deity. He said that I am perfect. I am the only way to heaven. I am the Savior of the world. And you know, we live in a world where a lot of people will say, well, we're just going to make Jesus a good teacher. He's a great guy. Let's go in and, and just, you know, we'll nitpick a little bit of the things. We'll pick what we like. And, you know, Love your neighbor as yourself, forgive, all of these things. But Jesus claimed he was so, so much more. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Doesn't matter who you think is a good pastor. 
They cannot go around in a Wednesday night service, come in and say, listen, I want to tell you something about myself. I'm the resurrection and the life. If I did that, y'all would be wanting me to get some mental help. Which is probably the very right thing to do. Jesus was either who he said he was, or he was the biggest, biggest liar who ever lived. He made those claims. And what does Easter show us? It shows us that he is who he claimed to be. He said, listen, I'm going to do something. I am going to turn myself over to sinful man. They are going to put me on a cross, but on the third day I'm going to rise again. Jesus cleared the money changers out of the temple. He turned it uh, upside down. He said, listen, you're going to kill me, but I'm going to come back. Three days later. The resurrection shows that everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus did, all of the claims that Jesus made, yes, it was absolutely 100% true. You ever had somebody who claimed to be able to do something but couldn't, just couldn't do it? Um, there was a news, or, a news report one night uh, talking about how carnival games, a lot of them were scams, that they were unwinnable. You just couldn't, couldn't do it. It was now uh, impossible, one in a million chance. And they went up to this one guy at a carnival, and he went up and they said, okay, you know, is this a rigged game? He's like, no, no, no. He said, all right, can you do it? And the guy jumped over the counter and I think it was something like a little bottle toss or ring toss or something like that. He grabbed a bunch of rings. He said, yeah, I can do it. No problem. And he goes, bink, bink, bink. And he misses. And he misses. And he misses. like 15 minutes, he's doing this thing. And you're like, no, 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 no. You said you could do it. When you're at your 200th ring, no, no, you can't. It's a game you're not going to be going after. Saw another newscast. It's about a painter. It's kind of interesting. If you hired this painter, he'd come and do the job. It might be a three-day job, might be a two-week job, that doesn't matter. But the very last day of painting, as he is going over everything, making sure everything is perfect, he came and he dressed in a black tuxedo. And he made this claim. He said, Look, if I'm going to go through and I'm going to be painting all the stuff that I've been painting. And I'm coming in here on the last day and I'm going to make sure all this is good. If I get one drop of paint on myself with this black tuxedo and I'm not going to use a white paint, you're going to see it. He said, I get one drop of paint on me, it means I'm wasting your paint and therefore you don't have to pay. And they said in all the years that he's been in business, he's never had to pay up. That's a painter I would hire. Jesus claimed so many things. That all, it, it all set him up to be someone amazing. And what did he do? He knocked it out of the park. He said, listen, I'm going to give my life a ransom for me. And on the third day, I'm going to raise again. And hallelujah, the grave is empty. The grave is empty. So the question we've got to ask is, how do you treat Jesus? How do you treat Jesus? You know he rose from the dead. Do you say, so what? Or do you acknowledge him as Lord and Master? See, we treat people differently when we acknowledge and we know who they are. Jesus is who he claimed to be. But notice also, Jesus has the power he claimed to have. Jesus has the power he claimed to have. John 10 and verse 18, all power on earth and in heaven is given to me. Because he was God, he could do anything that he wanted to do. He says, no one takes my life from me. Uh, I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. No force could place Jesus in the tomb but Jesus himself. He gave his life over to the Romans to put him in the tomb. They put the big stone in front of the tomb. And he sealed it. And there was a 24-hour guard. 
But they were only trying to prevent the inevitable. He had all the power in the world, and they couldn't stop him. Do you realize the security that Jesus had at the tomb? Here he was, dead, rolled up in a linen cloth. They put him in a borrowed tomb, and they rolled a very considerable stone. The idea was that they did not want wild animals going into this tomb to go and, and desecrate a body, to go in and, and start chewing on it and start, start feeding on it. So they would take huge, very heavy stones that took more than one person to go and, and roll it in place, to seal it up. But beyond that, they said that they sealed it, meaning that they sealed it with the seal of Rome. And the idea was, hey, break this seal and you go against Rome itself. That you would bring down the might of Rome upon you. But beyond that, there were Roman soldiers, trained killers, with the job of being in the tomb. They were, in the, they, were, they were there to protect the tomb. Now they had one of two options. They could fulfill their duty or they could die. If they abandoned their post, if they didn't defend it with their life, Rome had a very simple solution. It's like, look, you abandoned your post. Guess what? You're dead. They had all of these different things going on. And what happened? The stone was rolled away. Jesus was not found there anymore. He has the power to do it all. Easter shows us that all that we bring to Jesus is justified. That when we take our cares, when we take our struggles, when we take our difficulties, when we take our sins, when we take all of that to Jesus, He is able to take care of it. I remember one time I was with my grandfather and um, the, uh, the rotors, the brake rotors on, uh, on the car that I had at the time needed to be turned. Um, for those that don't, don't know what turning rotors are, that, it's that little thing, the brake pad goes on. The brake pad goes against that, and that's what stops the car. And if it's warped, if it's got some gouges in it, um, you, you need to have it flat. And to turn it makes it flat again. Well, we got the car up on some jacks and stands and all, and we got the rotors off. And in getting the rotors off, uh, my grandfather said, oh, don't worry, I know a guy. I'm like, okay. So what do we do? We, we go, and we go drive, and drive a little ways. We go out in the country, and we go to a guy, and it does not look like this guy is a mechanic. We go in, and he looks like he's former. He looks like he's many things. But a mechanic, he didn't, it looked like he didn't even have the setup to be a mechanic. My grandfather knew him, and he goes up and says, Hey, i got these rotors. Can you turn them? He looks at him like, No, nah, no problem. I'm like, okay. We leave them there, we go, we come back, and lo and behold, they're brand new. I don't know how he did it. He didn't look like it. He was, he was one that could do it, but he did an amazing job. You know what? We live in a world where we're ridiculed by our faith in Jesus. We have problems and difficulties and struggles. We have things that we're, we're trying to work out within our own life. And what do we do? We go and bring them to Jesus. And the world says, why in the world are you bringing them to him? Why don't you go to the professionals? Why don't you go and do this? Why don't you go and do that? You know why I go to Jesus? Because he is the one who has the power to forgive my sins, to put my feet on the solid rock. He is the one who showed me he has all of the power. Friends, let me ask this morning, when do you run to Jesus? When do you run to Jesus? Let me give you the only good answer to that question. When do you run to Jesus? Here's the answer. First. There's the answer. First. You know what the honest answer is that we have to give a lot of times? Last. 
When we have a problem, we'll go and we'll try to fix it. We'll go to the world and try to fix it. We'll try to ask advice from other people. We'll try to fix it. And then after all the other things are done, we're like, Jesus, can you fix this? And he fixes it. The church has a lot of doors, a lot of uh, different keys to set doors. There's keys to the sanctuary. There's keys to the education building, my office, the church office, the um, <coughs> room where the air condition is, the choir room, the bus garage. There, there's a lot of keys at the church. And you know, at my house, I have a keychain that I have color-coded with every single key for a door lock here at, uh, at the church. And uh, Allison and Grace know this. I call it my rainbow. If I ever, if I ever like, in, in a pinch, and I'm like, hey, can, can you go get me the rainbow? Because the rainbow has them all. It has keys on there. I don't think you can fit any locks here. <laughs> but you know what? If, if you were to call me up, and you're at the church, and I'm at the house, and you're like, I got a door that needs to be opened. You know what I reach for? I reach for the rainbow. Why? Because rainbow can open it all. Friends in our life, why don't we reach for Jesus more? Because he is the one with the answers to whatever our life throws at us. Easter is the reminder of the one who has all power. He has the power who he claimed uh, to have. But finally this, Jesus does what he promised to do. Jesus does what he promised to do. Mark 10, verse 32, They will mock and flog and kill me, but after three days I will come back to life. The cross was not a surprise to Jesus. The tomb, not a surprise. The betrayals didn't take Jesus off guard because he knew what he was going to do. He made the promise. Friends, Easter is a reminder that whatever Jesus had said he was going to do, he actually did. Let me ask, what do you trust Jesus with? If he is always faithful, what have you trusted him with? Your choices, your life, your finances, your future, your schooling, your job, your family. Because Jesus rose that he is who he says he was, he has the power that he said he had, and he kept his promises that he made. So we go back to that question, so what? So what? Jesus rose from the dead, so what? So what if he is who he claimed to be, if he has that power, and if he fulfills his promises? Let me close with four things that Easter means for you. Every single one of these things is something that you yourself can say, regardless of your background, regardless of your present, regardless of what's going on in your life right now. It doesn't matter. You are able to say these things. First is this. My past can be forgiven. My past can be forgiven. Doesn't matter what you've done in the past. We can look at countless individuals within the Word of God and see how terrible of a past they had. The Apostle Paul is one. He was one that went and uh, hung down Christians, threw them in jail. But Jesus got a hold of them. You know, whatever our past is, Jesus can offer forgiveness. There was an old show, many of y'all probably remember, called Columbo. It was a detective show. Um, the guy's name was Columbo. He went and he solved these different mysteries. There was one particular uh, episode where Johnny Cash was the guest star. Johnny Cash was actually the one that, that committed the crime. Spoiler alert, sorry. But after all was said and done and it was revealed, Johnny Cash's character finally admits that he was the murderer and he says this. I'm glad I don't have to pretend anymore. The guilt was killing me. Friends, what 
guilt is killing you today, is weighing you down that you can't hardly live, Jesus is able to offer forgiveness. Colossians 3.14 He has forgiven all our sins and canceled every record of the debt we owe. Christ has done away with it by nailing it to the cross. It could be the great news that you need to hear today for this Easter on 2023 is that your past can be forgiven. If you would simply come to him in repentance and say, listen, Jesus, this is all that I've done wrong, and I don't want this in my life anymore. I want to turn away, and I need your forgiveness. But not only can your past be forgiven, notice also this, my present problems can be managed. My present problems can be managed. There was an author by the name of Charlie Shedd he tells this story on, his, on himself. He says, before he and his wife had kids, they used to travel across the country teaching a, le a lecture called The Ten Commandments for Raising Perfect Kids before they had kids. <laughs> he and his wife Martha had their first child. He changed it to Ten Hints for Parents. After their second child, he relabeled the lecture a few tentative suggestions for fellow strugglers. He said after the arrival of the third child, he gave up speaking on the topic altogether. Maturity is when you find out that you don't have it all figured out. Maturity is when you realize that you can't manage all of life and all that life is going to send you. But God can He's simply by faith saying, Lord, this is the mess of my life. I can't manage it. But you know what? You can. You can set me on the right path. You can tell me the right way to go. And Lord, I can just simply submit to you. I can just simply find myself under your power and go forward. Ephesians 1 and verse 20, how incredibly great is his power to help those who believe in him, the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. Friends, are you ready to have those things managed? It simply is putting your faith in Him. But you know also this, you can say that my future can be secure. My future can be secure. One of the universal problems that is everywhere is the problem of death. We age, we get sick, and we know that everybody dies. People don't like to talk about death. If you have a big gathering going over today, uh, I, I don't recommend at the dinner table saying, all right, everybody, let's just talk about death. Don't do that. But it is an inevitable thing. Somebody asked some children to write sentences about what they believed about death. Glenda, age 8, said this, When you die, they put you in a box and bury you in the ground because you don't look too good. <laughs> Stephanie, age 9, said, Doctors help you so you won't die until you pay their bill. <laughs> Marsha, age 9, When you die, you don't have to do homework in heaven unless your teacher is there too. <laughs> the fact is, everybody's longing to know, what is it that happens? What happens? What happens when you breathe your last? Well, the most glorious and wonderful thing about Easter is Jesus knows. Because he's already been there and he came back. And what we read in the Bible is when we have our faith and our trust in him, that when death comes for us, this body might fade away. But we will be taken to heaven. We can know what our future is because we can know who Jesus is. Friends, do you know him today? Do you know him as your Savior? 
I'd like to remind you that the cross was plan A. There was no plan B. Christ knew what he was going to do. Christ knew what he had to pay. That you and I might be able to obtain eternal life. Our future can be known. But finally this, you're able to say my purpose in life can be known. Each and every one of us here was made with a purpose to glorify God. So often we go through life haphazardly, any old way we want to. But the reality is we were made for a purpose. And that purpose was to glorify God. Friends, this morning, as my time is gone, I'd ask you, do you know him? Has Easter made an impact in your life? Do you look at the empty tomb with great joy and, what, uh, and great anticipation because you know that because of that, you don't have to worry about that? Or do you look at Easter and say, I just don't understand this? You know, the way we understand Easter is we know the one it's all about. Jesus Christ, who died on a cross to take the punishment for all the wrongdoing in your own life. He died, was buried, and his power was so great that death couldn't hold him. That's the joy we have in knowing that we, we can conquer death. Death didn't conquer Jesus. And the promise of the Word of God is that, that we would come to Him in faith and say, Lord, I am repenting of my sins, all the wrong that I have done. And Lord, I am asking You to forgive me and to the best of my abilities. Lord, I want You to come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. That He would save you. That He would give you a new life. That He would go and give you a new purpose. That you might glorify Him. This morning in the time of invitation, we're going to be singing a rather upbeat song, Christ Arose. It celebrates the fact that he arose victorious. But you know what? During that time, if you simply want to come, I'd love to show you and pray with you that you might accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. It could be the Lord just being, been talking to you about something in particular. It could be something in your heart and your life that you just want to put before him. It could be church membership. It could be baptism. It doesn't matter. Because you know what? That's what this time of invitation is for. That you might do business with God. That he might get the glory. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Lord, I pray now for your church. I pray your Holy Spirit would, would move in our hearts and lives. Lord, that a great and a mighty and wonderful work would be done. For the ones here that know you as Savior, I pray that you would strengthen their faith. Lord, for those that might not know you as Lord and King, I pray that today would be that day that they would give their life over to you. Lord, work upon us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 359, Christ Arose. As we stand, would you come?